Okay, hello everybody, thank you for coming. And uh, my name is Alexey Romanenko. Uh, I'm Ismail. Uh, and uh, today we are going to talk about uh, developing new I.O. connectors in Apache Beam. So it just happened that uh, we spend a lot of time on different I.O. connectors, new features, issues. So and we wanted to share some knowledge and experience with you about that. Uh, quick agenda, so uh, I will kind of give a IO crash course in 45 minutes <laughs> and uh, initially we will talk about initially what actually the IO connector is, why is it important and uh, then a brief explanation of the structure of our IO connector in BIM uh, then uh, we will give some recommendations how to write connector and uh, maybe to avoid some potential issues uh, with that. Uh, of course, a few words about IO uh, connector testing and uh, in the end, just uh, kind of advanced stuff about uh, several IO patterns which could be used or either by using connector or by developing them. Okay. Uh, in general, the code base in BIM could be considered could be split it into four layers. So the first kind of low layer, layer level layer is a runner code, which is really responsible to run BIM pipeline on different uh, data processing engine like Spark, Link, Google Dataflow, and so on. Uh, on top of that, we have a layer of SDK, which is responsible to support your favorite language. Uh, then, on top of that, we have our Beam Transforms and uh, IO Connectors. And finally, on the top, we have a user code, which is, say, you write it to create and finally run the pipelines. So, as you can see, our IO connectors and B transforms are on the same level, so it actually it means that IO connector is just another beam transform. Uh, and also it means that IO is just another data processing task. And uh, actually, it's very important because uh, uh, if it doesn't work well, so it could cause potential data issues, data corruption, or data loss. Uh, BIM already provides a uh, bunch of different transforms, of course, so we can uh, literally split it into two different groups, like uh, element-wise transforms, so in general it's like a map transform, uh, group by key transforms, so the different group by key, for group by key and combined, and based on then other transforms, and uh, using these two so primitives, we can create uh, composite transforms, so the number is unlimited, uh, and actually I.O. connector usually is a composite transform. Mm. <coughs> Classical example of word count and beam, uh, well, in this way it consists of four different uh, transforms. Uh, the second one and the third one is the user transforms, which is a responsible to count words and to, uh, to prepare format for output. But the first and the last one is a transform which is responsible to read and, and write data uh, <coughs> using the text I.O. connector. And, uh, of course, as uh, uh, all other frameworks, being provides uh, already implemented a uh, bunch of different I.O. connectors ready to use. Uh, so for file systems like HDFS, uh, Google File System, AWS S3, messaging, different uh, support of different, of different file formats like text, Tavro, Parquet, and so on. Of course, databases, cloud databases, many of them. We still have a bunch of them in the progress, so and in the development. So actually, this is a good opportunity maybe to start your, your <coughs> contribution. So now actually it's a question. So why 
uh, would I need to write yet another connector? Right? Uh, there are actually several reasons for that. Uh, the first one is a uh, big data world is always growing, so uh, new data storages appears on the market. Unfortunately, there is no universal big data API which could be used just automatically to support it in our beam, for example. Uh, so we need, uh, if we want to have this uh, support, or support of this storage in beam, need to write a connector for that. The second one is uh, usually if you write our pipeline on any data processing engine, it's already more probably support a connector for this uh, data storage, but we can't use it in beam because it doesn't comply with the beam model. Uh, it's uh, supported only by one engine actually and uh, it's usually not so efficient to work with Beam. So uh, the third one uh, usually uh, again some storages are developing as well they add new features which probably should be supported in Beam as well so we need to add this feature and uh, that is why we probably should enhance our already existing connector. <coughs> uh, enterprise world or sometimes well, you are not kind of loud, or you don't want to uh, open source your data storage or connector, so, uh, but you want to use Beam. So in this case, uh, also could be a case, um, uh, use case for that. And uh, finally, actually writing new connector or contributing to already existing, it's a good way of learning actually how Beam works internally. Okay, a few words about structure of uh, connector, but uh, in the beginning uh, we just want to tell a little bit about code requirements for connector. So the first thing is uh, serializability. Uh, since your source of sync classes could be instantiated on different workers, uh, they should be serialized. Uh, also, uh, to avoid some potential side effects, uh, all fields should be private or uh, sh uh, should be final, and uh, collections also should be immutable as much as possible. So, actually, it will kind of sim simplify your life in the future. Uh, in case if your um, engine supports uh, dynamic work balancing, uh, your <coughs> uh, connectors could be run in a multi-threaded environment, so it means that the code should be trade safe. Again, uh, otherwise, the uh, potential to cause uh, data corruption or data loss. And uh, of course, uh, we have to test it properly, so uh, it should be easy to, to write new tests and uh, to test it on, under different conditions. Uh, generally, uh, all connectors, it's just a wrapper around uh, several P transforms. So it is, uh, normally it's read and write. Uh, sometimes uh, we add some other transforms as well. Uh, and the read and write are different only in terms of the type of uh, parameters which we use for P transform. Retransform uh, kind of uh, it consists in general of two parts. The first part is the configuration part, and uh, it's responsible to configure your uh, retransform, like uh, to set hosts, topics, uh, some other configurations. Uh, for this, in this case, we use a uh, usually auto value to s simplify. Uh, boiler template and uh, to make again our life easier. And the second uh, part is a uh, expand method, which is uh, responsible to return the P collection of elements, and where actually we create the instance of our source object. Source uh, can be implemented in, implemented into roughly in two different ways. So the first one is a 
source base tree, so using source API. In this case, source API or unbounded or for unbounded source will be responsible actually to split your input data into chunks. Then uh, every runner do some magic to spread these chunks over the workers. And then every worker will create a reader and finally start to read this uh, your chunk in a loop. Implementation of this can be uh, done in kind of using uh, three methods. So, for example, for bounded source, we extend our source from bounded source class. And uh, we need to implement um, normally split method, which actually takes uh, the input desired bundle size and bytes, and then a uh, user just to create, to create a list of bounded source, uh, get estimated size bytes, which kind of returns the number of uh, estimated size of your data, and uh, then every source should be able to create own reader, which will be then finally responsible to actually read data from source. Unbounded source, again, is extended from unbounded source class, and uh, it's a little bit different because uh, in this case, reader should support checkpointing. So in this case, it will uh, take as a parameter checkpointed mark object, and uh, optionally we uh, we can have a method to re re remove a duplicated records. Uh, bounded reader, uh, four main methods just to start and close. So when we, we for example, open connection to our uh, data source using the client object, or then in, 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 in advanced method we just iterate over iterator to uh, get new element, get current, we return actual, actual elements, or through an exception if there is no element anymore. And in close, we just uh, clear resources, for example, close the connection. So, pretty easy. Uh, unbounded reader, again, a little bit more complicated, because in this case, we also need a, I mean that, because unbounded source is responsible to support watermarks uh, and the checkpoint. So, in this case, we should implement two other methods uh, for this case, and, uh, well, Checkpointed uh, watermarks uh, could be implemented in a different way, so it's up to you how to do that actually in your source uh, IO. Uh, as I said, uh, in this case we use a source API or source interface. Uh, it's not required, sometimes it's not needed, sometimes it's a little bit more complicated, it could be done more easily. But why and when we should use it? Uh, normally, just for different cases when it could be helpful. Uh, we use it for unbounded sources. Uh, we also can use it if we need to, to provide uh, progress and size estimation uh, in your pipeline. Uh, also, in case if your uh, backend engine supports dynamic work rebalancing. And uh, also, if we want to use a part which is uh, provided by the runner. But, we also, re we always have but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, well, uh, the, the source API has, a, has an issue. And is that it was designed to be reading the edge of the pipelines. So, initially, well, it was conceived to do reads that come from that are starting our process. Uh, but the reality is that there are many cases when reads can happen in the middle of, the, of a pipeline or even at the, almost at the end. Uh, and just to think a case like that, for example, imagine that you receive a message from PopSub and this message contains the path of some data that you have to read. Traditionally, doing this kind of composition in Beam is quite hard because, well, the source API is not really composable. Uh, so, so so one, one approach to make it more composable is to do our reads, especially based on maps or part twos in Beam speak. Uh, so, and, and we have some kind of way to hack the problem of uh, 
splitting and parallelizing the reads because well if you just apply one read it, well <coughs> it wouldn't be parallel so we can do this by having a function that splits the read in subsequent reads for example for each partition I create let's say that I have four partitions so I create four four reads and then I reshuffle those so reshuffle what it does is just to put it in, in every available worker so it can start the read <coughs> on every worker and in the end, we, we end up covering the splitting part of the, of the source API. Of course, well, we, we don't support uh, dynamic word rebalancing, and, and we didn't introduce the term for those who don't know, but dynamic word rebalancing is the ability, for example, if you are doing a read that is too slow in one worker, we can cut and reassign the missing part into a different uh, 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 worker, so the, the execution goes faster. We cannot do this with normal Pardu, and also, well, we cannot do uh, continuous onboarding um, reads with, uh, because it's not supported. Uh, but well, just to expand a little bit on reshuffle, the reshuffle is what we use to, let's say, reparallelize the, the, the read. And in, in the previous example, we do it because we have to, if we want to reassign this into every worker. But there is also another use case is when we have a lot of outputs from our Pardu function. And we, when it's really big, well, maybe we were interested in reparallelizing this into, into the workers. Uh, but the real solution for this uh, in this pretty, well, pretty recent uh, uh, API on Beam, that is Splitable Dufon. Uh, and the idea of Splitable Dufon is, well, to try to tackle the issues of compos compos composability of, uh, of the source API and the limitations of Pardu or, or normal Dufon. So, as I, as I said, well, it's, it's, we have the issue that we cannot reparallelize uh, existing, existing uh, requests, and we can have infinite uh, elements produced by a normal Pardu. So, we, we, the way to address this is to introduce uh, a new concept, and the idea is that, well, we, usually we have an element that is our request to read something in the case of IOS, but we also are going to add a, a second part that is what we call a restriction. A restriction is something that allows us to define what part of the work uh, are we doing at this moment. So we are going to see this in detail. And this part could be split. This, this is from where it comes the name. So just to give an idea, let's see some of the restrictions. So this makes more sense. For example, if we are reading a file, well, our restrictions are the bound boundaries of the file, and, and in this case, for the are the offsets, no? So, what's the starting offset? What, what's the ending offset? And of course, I can split this in the middle into more space, uh, uh, more restrictions. And also, well, in the case of big table or, or edge base, uh, the tables are identified by a row key, and they are they are sorted. So we can assume that the start key and the end key are always going to be. In order, so we can have this as a restriction. Also, in the case of Kafka, we can have the start of the end offset. Um, so, when we don't have this restriction that defines the complete read that we are going to do, it can be subdivided, and this we call cracking in, in the Spitalut of terminology. And here you can see how it's cracked, and this is what is going to be read by every worker. But here is where the magic is. Uh, the way we can, we can achieve uh, infinite reads is by cracking this in, in, a, in a way that is continuous, a little bit like recursion in, in the process. So to understand a little bit this in detail, well, I'm going to present how we did the, we, we changed the edge base IO to be split to do found based. And the first step when you are going to create a, an, an, a read based on split to found is to identify the restriction that you are working on. So in, in the case of um, edge base or big table, as I mentioned, well, you have the key, that is a byte key, uh, an array of bytes. And we already in Bing had this, this type that was byte key. And even we already have this type that is byte key range, defining a, a start and an end of a key, so covering one range, let's say. So we, 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 it was easy because we already had the, the restriction in the, in the code base. However, the second part is to, to implement a restriction tracker. And well, this is uh, a new concept also of, of the split the phone. A restriction tracker allows us to, um, let's say, track the progress of the, of the read. And this is done by doing claims. So we, we do claims from the block that we have read. 
in this case, for example, if I'm reading continuously, I'm, I'm claiming uh, steps. And, and with this, uh, I, I can decide, for example, point to stop and what, uh, know what is, hasn't been read or, or not. Um, these uh, restriction trackers are about implementing interface that I won't go into the details, but uh, they're really, you know, if you are going to implement this, pay a lot of attention to the test because it's easy to don't, don't get it right. But you can see the examples well for, for this. Uh, so this, how is this done in the implementation? Well, you have a normal do, do fun uh, function, and you have uh, you, you first you define your, your initial restriction. So in the case of of edge base, well, our restriction, as we said, is the is the limits of the scan. So we have the, the start row and the end row, and this produces the range that we care about. And for every for every restriction, we have an associated tracker. So we we, we create. This like that. This is just to register this for the use of the of the runner when it runs. And uh, the third part is that we have to define the split function. And in the case of uh, of uh, this is called an initial split. And in the case of HBase, we already had uh, a function to split based on regions. So what we had to do here was just to adapt uh, before in, in every normal I/O a, sp a split function return a list of sources that then are read. In this case, we return a list of restrictions because, well, it's, it, it covers the same. And the nice thing is that we will use the same code, but we just had to to uh, refactor it uh, to produce uh, first the, the restrictions and for the old uh, source-based approach, well, from the restrictions, create the sources. Uh, the implementation also is here. Well, this again is a new annotation to, to split restrictions. We receive our element, that is the query, and the, and the restriction. And as I mentioned, well, you, we, we, we look for regions, and then we split for, for every region the, the restriction. Uh, finally, the read part is done in a normal process element. And what is key here is that we have a new element that is the restriction tracker as part of the read. And why we have this as an argument? Because we have to claim what we have read. The rule and this is the sacred rule of uh, reads with double do is you can only output what you have claimed, because otherwise you will produce a consistent state. Uh, and those, this because the tracker is, is the one who is tracking <laughs> this, uh, the progress and what has not been processed. Uh, just as a side note, uh, in, in, in this code you will find a weird case that is the upper bound for edge base, because we don't have an upper bound for edge base, so so this, this allows us to close the, the read well, We have to check the Jira for all the crappy, bizarre details. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, OK, so now the question is, should I use split double do fun? And well, uh, let's say that we are getting closer. I would say yes, if it helps you to cover one case that you cannot do with the current APIs. And the most important case we can cover now is watch continuously for new resources. So, for example, if you have a, a, a path of a directory in a file system and you want to read new files that are registered into the file system, this is already implemented in BIM and you can use it, but your runner has to support split that with the phone. And, uh, and well, uh, well if, if, you, if the restriction you can identify it easily, I would recommend to try to implement it like this. However, well, you always have to check the support of the runners, and let's say that for... for bounded reads or batch, uh, all the runners have a really naive implementation, so this is covered. For, to support data w w uh, dynamic word rebalancing, there is still not finished. This is, I, I, I knew that they were working on this in data flow, not sure it's finished. Uh, for the streaming, in, it's already supported by data flow and Flink, as, as far as I know. And the, and the most critical part is for the portability-based runner. This is ongoing work, so this is work in progress. And maybe someone knows more of the current status <laughs> that we work on this. I don't know more. Uh, but well, I'm optimistic in the sense that we are getting closer to s pass the chicken or egg problem of IO and runners because well, IO authors didn't want to use the out the phone because runners didn't support it, and runners authors didn't have the motivation to do it because they were not IOs. So well, <laughs> we are getting closer. So. Uh, now we are going to talk about writes. Yes. Uh, writes, much simpler than read. So 
just a few words about that. Uh, we don't have any API specific API for our writes. Uh, so just use the port 2 for that in case if our writes will be more complicated than just port 2. So use a composite transform based on port 2 group by key. So it could be useful in case if you need to support a data duplication because of failure, so retries. So the key thing in write you should guarantee that your, da that your data is properly was written. Uh, so, and that's it. Uh, and uh, one more thing about uh, fi file-based things. So, don't uh, use uh, all the duplicated file-based thing I.O. Just, uh, in this case, your write should be based on a file I.O. write. Because it's already actually implemented and support many things which you need in your file based IO. Uh, so, generally, our example of write transform could be again two parts like a configuration part and the expand part, where we uh, take an example uh, as an input the collection of our records and then create the writer function, which is will actually do effect. And uh, do a fan, uh, in this case, should implement uh, these methods like, uh, again, setup where we create our producer, process element, we take our, our element as an input, then add it into producer, but usually we don't write it directly uh, just to avoid uh, overloading our um, backend storage. So and, uh, that is why in the finished bundle, we usually just fl flush this bundle of records. And uh, of course, uh, we should add some kind of error um, handling in this case, or retries, or and so on. It, just a quick example. And then here done, we usually close connection. But uh, be aware about that that here down, is, there is no guarantee that it will be called. So it's kind of best effort. Uh, I don't rely on the, on this uh, on one hundred percent. We had issue with that. Uh, some recommendations uh, of raising a uh, connector. So, well, naming is <coughs> most important thing. Uh, so, normally just name of your backend uh, storage and uh, add a suffix. So, it's, uh, this is how we call all our IO connectors. Uh, it's defined and just use a uh, verbs uh, for factory functions like uh, read, write, write bytes, and so on. Without. Uh, and don't use a kind of system words which you use the in Beam in different contexts and uh, like transform some sync to avoid the uh, uh, confusion in this case. Configuration. Uh, mm -hmm. Important part because uh, mm -hmm. we usually need to configure our transform. Uh, but kind of the rule of thumb in this case, don't uh, expand all configuration options. And try to minimize it and to make it easy to use your uh, I.O. For, for user. Uh, so it should be necessary, configuration parameters um, should be necessary just to have an output uh, of your transform. Uh, example, usually just host names or topics names, something which is uh, really required. In case if your uh, back and storage support additional configuration, don't uh, uh, mirror each parameter for that uh, in your IO API, uh, just add a kind of methods uh, with a configuration where you, you can pass a configuration object or file for that. In this case it uh, will be easy and more evident how to use it, like what we do in the Kinesis IO in this case. Coders, uh, also an important part, so if it's possible, use a standard coder, coders, uh, and don't rely on the Java serialization. Uh, it doesn't work uh, properly sometimes, so that is why uh, uh, if you kind of, uh, and if your backend storage, for example, already uh, supports some coders, just use them like we do, for example, in Kafka. Uh, 
error handling, uh, very important part. Uh, try to detect errors as, as soon as possible. Uh, this is like a chain of priority, like a compilation, creating a transform, applying, and running. So in this case, it will uh, help us to avoid the potential, again, data loss and data errors in this case. Uh, and uh, don't do this, never <laughs> like this, so <laughs> catch an exception, just write something into log and then continue. Uh, in this case, uh, you are 99% uh, that your error will be kind of dive into error logs or your logs and the user will be very surprised about kind of where are my records. Uh, in this case, I mean that, well, we just need there to catch an exception or either rethrowed it or somehow to do retry, so somehow to handle this error properly. Compatibility. Uh, once you write new I.O., uh, usually we mark it as a, with an experimental annotation. Uh, this is a good question, actually, when it becomes not experimental. <laughs> uh, but uh, deprecated, it's also very useful. Sometimes uh, you want to change uh, your API, uh, public API, I mean. So don't just drop it. Uh, in this case, we needed to mark it as a deprecated and kind of rule which was agreed so after three releases at minimum uh, it can be dropped uh, in case if a new API was provided and so it, this we think that it should be enough for users to move to new API in this case uh, documentation well we all like to write documentation but uh, sometimes we forgot about it so in this case, uh, just provide basic exa examples how to use your I.O. Again, it will help users to start using your I.O. And uh, if uh, there are some not evidence or kind of corner cases, uh, also please add it in into documentation and your users will be thankful for that. Uh, testing, well, uh, it's a big topic actually. We don't have too much time to talk about that, so uh, it's very important. Uh, so, uh, in general, we test I/O with two different type of tests. Of course, it's a unit test, and the idea just to verify that your logic of your I/O works properly with a different configuration of parameters and uh, for different cases. But uh, the main rule in this case, your test should uh, exe be executed quickly because it will run all the time. And uh, in this case, you need to use kind of a memory version or fake version of your data store. Uh, and uh, the size of data sets should be pretty small, like tens of hundreds uh, of rows, no more. Uh, in other case, it's an integration test. So this is idea is a completely different. Uh, usually they could run for some amount of time. Uh, they will run against kind of real instance of your data store. So it will take time to launch it then. Uh, normally the number of or amount of mm, data sets uh, also could be big. In this case, but the idea of this test just to catch some errors, which could be also kind of appear only in case if you use a, them in a real environment. Uh, so, in this case, uh, testing is very important in uh, IO because if it's well tested, so the, it will m minimize the chances of. Uh, data corruption or data loss, but try to find the balance between unit testing and in integration tests. So in this case, uh, your test will be run quickly, but at the same time, uh, some corner cases could be covered by integration tests and uh, it should be fine. Okay, are your patterns? Okay, so, well, this is, uh, I mean, after seeing how we do read, how do, what we do, we do writes. 
There are, there are new patterns on Beam, and, and this is for me an exciting part of the presentation that uh, allow us to do more stuff, and especially end users. But as uh, authors of iOS, you, we have to adapt some things to enable these patterns. So, well, the first pattern that started with the introduction of the concept of file IO. Uh, so the idea here is that before we had this uh, file format based IO, like Arrow IO or Text IO. And we did reads, and that was it. And you passed the, the path that you were going to read, and that, that, that's all. But uh, FileIO uh, makes this composable by exposing more transforms. One transform that match the results of that we are going to read, for example, expanding the globe. And then we have metadata about that. So we can maybe filter stuff here. And, and this is important, because we, can, we could, for example, in, in a distributed file system like S3 or, or Google Cloud Storage, we can get a version, for example, of the, a different version of the file, and we can do this kind of filtering here that was not possible to do there. Or we can filter by date, for example, or the date of the metadata. Uh, also, well, then the next, next part is just reading. And for an for a IO author that is going to support a new format, let's say that you are going to support, I don't know, ORC, for example, uh, well, I think that the, the approach now is it would be immediately to implement the read files method. Because with this, you just, you just do the core stuff that you have to do. So there is splitting and reading and producing an API collection as output. You shouldn't care about all of this because this exists already. So you, you win. And, and, you, um, and, and users can easily switch if they have already a composition like this from, your, from other I.O. to your I.O. So that's, that's one of the patterns. Uh, the second pattern is the weight on pattern. The idea here is that we can do, uh, for example, if we are doing a write, we can signal that the write ended, and with this signal we can trigger a next step. So, it's example here, but imagine that you're writing into JD, with JDBC into one database, and you want to only write after everything has been written, so this is how you connect it. It's uh, quite straightforward in the user part of the code. It's just uh, defining an API collection that with, with a signal. And then you use wait on and uh, to, tri to trigger the next step of the transformation. <coughs> so the second write, for example. Uh, in the implementation level, this implies that writes now have to return something. And this something, uh, well, it could be just void, and just to have a signal. But we recently discussed in the mailing list what should be a good return type for this, because all at this moment we are not, I mean, homogeneous in between the different IOs that support this. Uh, the agreement, the consensus was around creating a special write result and putting I inside of this write result what you care about in the next step. So if you don't care about anything, you just put void, just to do a normal signal. But you can maybe be interested in other things like saving failed records or number of failed records, so you can take those in the next step. There's still, this is, pre I mean, let's say that this is the current status, this can evolve in, in time. Uh, the third, and probably the biggest one, in my opinion, is that the IOS now, in my opinion, should be row first. So you, you should provide, if you can, read functions and write functions that support row. Yeah. And the advantage are, and are numerous. Uh, well, first one is that all the newer APIs for, for, for the schema-based P collections will be available for free. And the second part, you need to implement a method that allows to pass a configuration that comes in this object that is like some sort of typed map that is going to be expanded into all your IO API to request in the target language. This is highly experimental because it's pretty recent and well, so far only Kafka is supported, but I think we will get into a, a new standard of, uh, for most of the IOs. Uh, so, well, that's, that's all for now. If you care about this and you want to go deeper, well, these are some links that we recommend. If you want to go deeper into Splitable to Phone and all these details, also the presentation by Eugene is quite good. Uh, one, one thing that is uh, just a message for people who is interested in this area is that there is a lot of work to do still. I mean, there are many, many data stores that can be supported. And even the ones that we support can be improved to take all these patterns. So if you want to start contributing to this project, this is one really nice area to do so. Mm. Uh, well, that's it. Thank you. Questions? <laughs>